Level 2 6733 Classified Item Number SCP-6733 Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-6733 is currently contained in Tape Bolt F, Shelf ST, Box Number 1994, in the Recorded Media section of the Site-73 Archives. The Tape Bolt is a controlled environment designed to mitigate data degradation arising from temperature and humidity. Efforts to identify the actors and locations depicted in SCP-6733 are currently ongoing. Stills of the cast are compared weekly to new entrants in the Foundation Facial Recognition Database. A manual effort is underway to investigate contemporary film production sets and compare these to SCP-6733's locations. SCP-6733 is a VHS tape cassette containing a recording of the horror movie, The Suburb Slasher Strikes Again, which was, according to the cassette slipcase, produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1985. The movie appears to be a sequel to SCP-5733, The Suburb Slasher Returns. The primary antagonist of SCP-6733 is The Suburb Slasher. 6733-1, a spree killer who was also present in SCP-5733. When watched, the film causes the observer to become a conduit for the localized destabilization of reality. Only one viewing of the film, ordered by research lead Dr. Carpenter, has been conducted and documented. See test details below. However, it is currently hypothesized that testing may have occurred more times than currently thought. Investigation is underway. Testing The testing order comprised of D-Class personnel being shown SCP-5733 up to the point its anomalous properties manifest. The same D-Class was then to be shown SCP-6733, with the tape inserted into a VHS player attached to a television situated in a testing chamber. Given the unknown effects of SCP-6733, the D-Class would be left alone in the chamber to watch the film, and interviewed following the conclusion of the film. The contents of SCP-6733 and its effects are documented in the addenda below. Addendum 6733.1 Testing Log Act 1 Testing Log Footage begins. Dr. Malcolm Baines enters the testing chamber. D-1974 is sat down, opposite a television and VHS set. Hi, Jamie. I'm assisting in today's experiments. How are you feeling following the film? Hey, good to meet you. I'm feeling okay, thanks. One of the nicer experiments I've been involved in. Good to hear. We're just going to run some quick tests. Over the next five minutes, Dr. Baines administers cognitive impairment tests to D-1974. All results are within baseline. Okay, so, with those out of the way, let's talk about the film. Could you tell me what you saw, please? Like, the plot and stuff? Yes, that sounds like a good starting point. It was pretty much your standard slasher film. There was a group of teens who just graduated high school and go to a local camping site by a lake to celebrate. One of them mentions is near the site where the killer, the Slasher, was shot dead by police a year prior after a rampage. Would this be the events of the first film? D-1974 shrugs. It's not really clear. They all think it's a joke, apart from the main girl. She says her dad's a police officer, and she's seen video evidence of the attack. No one references any of the characters from the first film, though, and they don't show up in this one either. The Slasher's the only constant. Interesting. Please continue. So they all go camping by the lake, but soon everything starts going to shit. The site's caretaker gets killed off-screen. Then the Slasher starts stalking the kids and doing away with them. Doing away how? Uh, let's see. D-1974 checks the notes he made during the screening. He's still got a kitchen knife, same weapon as the first film, so he stabs a lot of them. It's pretty gory for the time it was made. He slashes up someone's face, then the nerdy guy gets stabbed through the eye, 
That one's pretty good. The camera gets sprayed with blood. One of the last teens gets his head crushed wide open. D-1974 chuckles to himself. There's a walk-in freezer in the main admin building, where one of her maids has been hung up. It's never explained why a campsite needs one of those, but it's just there. <laughs> the slasher locks someone in there, then throws her body, shattering it into a bloody, icy slush. How do these scenes make you feel? Like, there's some good jump scares, and the tension's fairly high at points, but it's a little dated. I've seen scarier, but I've also seen worse horrors. Anything feel like it particularly lingers and stays with you? D-1974 does not immediately respond. Well, the end scene. The end scene is pretty weird. Tell me about it. D-1974 fidgets, avoiding eye contact with Dr. Baines. So, the girl and her best friend, the one that's been looking out for her this whole time, enter into a cellar. The slasher creeps up from behind and grabs the friend, tears his head clean off his neck. The slasher then chases the final teen to the side of the lake. He's advancing on her. The camera's set on the water of the lake. It's a wide shot. You've got the lake waterline parallel to the top and bottom of the shot, so it splits the screen horizontally. She's fallen over, crawling away from him. As he advances on her, the camera zooms in. Slowly, though. It takes its time. He does, too. There's music at the start of the scene. Deep, dark synths. This stops as the camera moves closer, though. I forgot to say, it's… it's a long scene. Longer than five minutes. Maybe it was ten. I don't know. It felt longer than ten. So the slasher's approaching her. We're, the viewers, approaching the shore. Then the music stops, and it's just its footsteps and her pleading. And she's pleading, man. She's… There's these big inhales of breath stifled by the mucus running out of her nose. She's babbling, but it gets to a point she's not even saying words, just making noise. D-1974 appears visibly distressed. What next? The camera's real close to the shore now, and the slasher stops. He turns his head and looks straight at the camera. You can't see his eyes, but you know he's looking straight at you. And he just stands there, staring. Eventually the girl crawls out of the frame, or the camera zooms past her. I can't remember which. It just keeps zooming in on his face, where his face should be under the hood. The girl keeps screaming off camera. Then there's this guttural ripping noise and the screaming stops. It just stops, but the camera keeps moving. You can see the individual droplets of blood splashed across him. You can see the fabrics that make up his hood. His face soon takes up the entire shot, and then… and then… it ends. No credits or nothing. The tape just cuts to black, and was pushed out the player. That's it? There was nothing else? No, that was it. Why would I lie? I didn't say you lied. When the girl was pleading, was she pleading at you? What do you mean? Was it like she was talking specifically to you? To Jamie? No, I don't think so. It was just… it was a disturbing scene. There wasn't anything weird in an anomalous sense. I just haven't seen a film end like that before. Okay, I understand. Was there anything else notable about the film? Anything else out the ordinary? D-1974 takes a moment to contemplate the question. I can't remember their name. Whose name? The girl. Her friends. All of them. I don't think they had names. Addendum 6733.2 Incident Log Act 2 Incident Log Dr. Baines enters D-1974's dormitory room. Hey, Doc. D-1974 rubs his eyes as Dr. Baines enters. Jamie, you wanted to speak with me? Yeah, I had questions. I wanted to know why I had to watch that film the other day. You know I can't share details like that with you. Why do you ask? I just… It wasn't snuff, right? It wasn't real? Everything's real in a sense. We have a tape of it. It must have been filmed. But as to the nature of the deaths, it's difficult to say. Did the effects seem realistic? You described one as corny yesterday. I thought it was yesterday. 
now I'm not so sure. I kept thinking about the film as I went to sleep, and then I dreamt it. I was there, crawling by the lake, and I remembered all my friends and their deaths, and they seemed so real. And when I woke up, I could have sworn, I could have sworn, that there was a shadow outside my room, someone leering in through the frosted glass of the door. What did you do? I was frozen. I've never felt fear like it before. I just sat upright in my bed, staring at the door. I hoped that if I kept watching, it wouldn't come in. When the sun rose and the light entered my room, it faded away. What's the scariest thing you've seen here? I… I don't understand the question. You must have worked with Anami before, or is this your first? Dr. Baines is silent for a moment. Why don't we get back to talking about you? You know there couldn't have been anyone outside yesterday. Security guard in the corridor would have seen something and raised the alarm. I want you to keep me updated, though. Any other dreams? See anything else that's untoward? Let me know. Thank you, Dr. Baines. Please, call me Malcolm. Dr. Baines leaves the dormitory, entering the adjacent corridor. He walks to the end and talks to the guard on duty. Hey, hopefully a quick one. Do you know the name of the person stationed here last night? Agent Cunningham. Or it was meant to be. He was assigned but failed to show, went to town before his shift and didn't come back. Bosses will have him fired faster than anything when he does show. I see. Thank you for your time. Night Balls Surveillance footage of the site exterior flags a humanoid shape moving through the surrounding forest. A guard appears and investigates, but finds nothing. Interior D-1974's dormitory. He tosses and turns in his sleep, before suddenly awaking and beginning to scream. A guard rushes into the room and calms him, then asks what is wrong. D-1974 is unable to recall what they dreamt. An intruder alert is generated on the sewage pipe in Sector STNKG. Security guards are dispatched. They make their way through the site to the sector and begin a search. After completing the search with no results, the alarm is deemed a false alarm. D-1974 is situated in an interview room, sat at a table in front of a one-way mirror. Dr. Bain swipes his keycard and enters the room. D-1974 stands and rushes over to him. Help Malcolm, thank God. You need to help me, please. Slow down, slow down. Let's sit down, okay? What's going on? The two walk back over to the table and take a seat. I'm in danger. It's coming for me. I just know it is. I feel like I'm being watched. I hear the pair of eyes constantly burrowing into the back of my skull. And I saw it. I saw it! Jamie, calm down. What did you see? The slasher. The suburb slasher. Out of the corner of my eye. Around corners. It's stalking me. I'm going to end up just like the victims in the film. You've got to help me. Look, it's okay. It's okay. Take a deep breath for a second. There is a moment of silence as D-1974 collects himself. The slasher can't be here. It would have tripped our security systems, shown up on surveillance. This isn't a sparsely populated site. Other people would have seen it. That's just the thing. It only appears when I'm alone, in between shifts, walking to my next assignment. It just stares at me, from a distance. It'll be in a place I can't reach, like on a walkway above me, or on the other side of a security door. The one time I said something, I tried to shout. It came out more like a whimper. It just walked away, but it didn't break eye contact. I'm going to need to notify security about this immediately. And I think it would be good if we got you some medicine. Something that would calm you down. You don't believe me? I'm not saying that. I just think you've not slept, and you're in a heightened state right now. If we're going to figure out what's going on, we need you lucid. How long have you worked at the Foundation? Excuse me? You know what you're doing, right? Of course I do. So I'm going to go get and get… Dr. Baines pauses. Fuck. Let me try that again. I'm going to go and get help. Is that okay? 
After a brief moment, D-1974 nods. Stay here. I'll be back shortly. Dr. Baines walks through the room door, swipes his keycard to unlock it, and leaves. It's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. D-1974 continues to repeat this mantra to himself. He stands, and begins to pace the room. D-1974 halts in place. He turns to face the mirror and exhales. His breast condenses in front of him. Temperature sensors within the room register a significant drop. You're here, aren't you? A gloved fist punches through the mirror. D-1974 screams. The shattered glass sprays across the room. D-1974 runs to the door. He hurriedly punches a combination to the door keypad, which glows red in a negative response. He shouts in frustration. The fist is withdrawn, then punches through the mirror once more, sending the remaining glass shattered into the floor. In the observation room on the other side stands an entity resembling the suburb slasher, SCP-6733-1. No, 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 no. D-1974, hurried, tries another numerical combination. The keypad flashes red once more. 6733-1 climbs through the broken mirror. Broken glass crackles as it steps into the interview room. Come on! Please! D-1974 tries once again to open the door. 6733-1 begins to walk slowly towards him. In its right hand, it carries a large kitchen knife. It reaches out with its left towards D-1974, who enters the last number in his latest combination attempt. The keypad flashes green, and the door swings open. 6733-1 lurches forward, but D-1974 throws himself into the adjoining hallway, narrowly avoiding its grasp. They hit the corridor wall and collapse to the floor. Help! Somebody help me! D-1974 attempts to stand and run towards the corridor's southern end, but missteps and falls once more. 6733-1 enters the corridor. It brandishes a kitchen knife and approaches D-1974. Hey, what's going on? At that moment, Security Officer Lauren has turned into the corridor from the north, whilst on patrol. He draws his weapon and aims at 6733-1. Put the knife down and step away from him. 6733-1 turns and faces the officer. It does not put down the knife. Last chance. I'm not playing around here. 6733-1 begins to stride up the corridor towards Lauren. I warned you! The security officer fires a single shot at 6733-1. The entity appears unaffected and continues to march forward. What the… Lauren fires a second shot, then a third, a fourth, a fifth. 6733-1 is unimpeded. S stop Lauren continues to fire. 6733-1 is soon stood right in front of him. Lauren fires again, point blank, yet the bullet seemingly had no effect. It continues to pull the trigger, generating a clicking noise from the empty chamber. 6733-1 stands momentarily still, before grabbing Lauren by the neck and raising him upwards effortlessly. 6733-1 branches the kitchen knife. Officer Lauren screams. 6733-1 thrusts the kitchen knife upwards, through Lauren's submental space. The knife travels via his mouth and into his nasal cavity. 6733-1 then forcefully pulls the knife towards itself, partially bisecting the front of Lauren's face. D-1974 watches, horrified. As 6733-1 turns round to face him, a security siren begins to sound, elsewhere. Site security are in the process of being mobilized to contain the anomaly. D-1974 turns and flees. The following events are captured by the security cameras in the southern staff locker room. D-1974 runs into the room, looking around hurriedly. Researcher Wesley McCray is the only person in the room. Having just finished a shift. Hey, what are you doing unaccompanied? D-1974 puts his fingers to his lips, 
and shushed his researcher McCray. Hide. We need to hide. Now hold on. There's no time to explain. It's coming. D-1974 runs to a row of lockers, opens one, and climbs in. His panicked face is just visible through the locker slits. After a moment of contemplation, McCray follows him, climbing into a locker directly opposite. A few moments later, SCP-6733-1 enters the room. It stalks once around the room, before standing at the end of a row of lockers, the row where D-1974 is hidden. It throws open the first locker. The door slams against the next locker, before bouncing back. The sound of metal on metal reverberates through the room. 6733-1 makes its way down the lockers, throwing each door open. It reaches the locker D-1974 is hidden in. It stands, silently in front of it for a moment, before whirling round and opening the opposite locker, containing McCray. What? No! 6733-1 brandishes a kitchen knife. Researcher McCray screams. The knife plunges into McCray's right orbit. Vitreous fluid bursts out as the eyeball loses its structural integrity. His right glass's lens shatters and broken glass falls into the orbital cavity. 6733-1 applies pressure, driving the knife further. Blood jettisons from McCray's eye, splattering across the ceiling. Footage is temporarily obfuscated by blood. Attempting to withdraw the knife from McCray's corpse, 6733-1 discovers it is stuck. D-1974 throws open the locker door, hitting 6733-1 and knocking it off balance long enough for him to escape, exiting the room. 6733-1 affixes McCray's head to the floor with his right foot and pulls on the knife with both hands. It rockets upwards, and 6733-1 resumes its chase of D-1974. No security footage covers the path taken by the pair upon leaving the room. After a few minutes, the security reconnaissance team REC, comprised of four members, arrives in the locker room. The team lead, Owens, kneels down to examine McCray's body. We need to find this thing, and fast. Let's split up. The team walk towards the room exit. The sight lights are dimmed. The rec team turn on their weapon flashlights. Madal, Mellor, take the corridor west, sweep every room. Rosso, with me, we'll head east. D-1974 runs through the site in search of aid. He makes his way throughout a maze of corridors, banging on doors and calling out for help. He finds none. Owens and Rosso enter the Department of Cryogenics Laboratories. Despite being devoid of researchers, equipment is still running. Owens turns to Rosso. I'll be right back. Owen heads deeper into one of the laboratories, as Rosso heads in the other direction. Clouds of condensed liquid roll out of open cryogenic fluid containers and tumble across the laboratory floor. Owen scans the room and notices the door to a storage locker is ajar. He takes the safety off his weapon and slowly approaches. He throws the door open. The locker is empty. Owens turns around to continue his search, only to be confronted by 6733-1, stood directly behind him. Owens opens fire directly into 6733-1's torso, but it has no effect. 6733-1 grabs the agent with both hands and throws him across the room. With a splash, Owens lands directly in a container of cryogenic fluid. Hey Owens, you in here? A short time later, Rosa returns looking for Owens. Owens! Owens, can you hear me? The container Owens was thrown into shows no sign of him. Suddenly, Rosso is knocked forward into the floor by an unknown force from behind. A shattering sound is heard. Ugh. He hits the floor with force. Many small red crystalline objects are scattered around him. Oh God! From the vantage point of the newly online camera, it is evident that the crystalline objects are the remnants of Owen's frozen corpse. Impaled in Rosso's back is a large fragment of frozen ribcage. SCP-6733-1 emerges from the shadows in the corner of the room. He slowly walks up to Rosso, who attempts to crawl away. 
Rosa looks up at 6733-1, which has positioned itself in front of him. P please 6733-1 responds to Rosa's request by raising its right foot and pressing down on his head. Rosa's face meets the floor as 6733-1 continues to apply pressure. Rosa attempts to scream as a puddle of blood begins to pull beneath his face. His arms swing wildly. With a sudden crack, his scalp splits open and spurts out a mess of viscera. Rosa goes limp. 6733-1 continues to step down. A stream of blood spurts from Rosa's scalp. Then, abruptly, his skull is crushed, and 6733-1's foot goes straight through fragments of bone, skin, hair, and brain, stamping on the floor beneath. Dr. Baines makes his way back to the interview room. Turning into the corridor, he spots the corpse of Officer Lauren. Oh no. Hello? Are you? Dr. Baines begins to run to Lauren's corpse. He stops calling out to it as he notices his mangled face. Hello? Is anyone there? Jamie? Dr. Baines continues to make his way through the site. He comes to the entrance of the site basement. He glances down the stairs before turning to leave. A noise is heard behind him, and he freezes. Jamie, is that you? He turns and begins to make his way slowly down the basement stairs. The steps creak upon contact. He reaches the bottom and enters the dimly lit basement. A figure jumps out from the shadows. Shh! We've got to be quiet. It's close. Jamie! You're alright. I was just in the interview room and I thought you were dead. I tried to find you, but I couldn't. The site's abandoned. I can't find anyone. You… you were just in the interview room, where you left me earlier? Yes, I went to find help. But there's no one else here. It's just us two. We need to stick together. That part of the site is over an hour away on foot. Dr. Bain stares at D-1974. We're scared and tired. It doesn't matter. We just need to press on. Despite everything we know, I think you can't comprehend unadulterated pure evil until it stares right at you. Today, I think evil has this in its sights. As Dr. Baines begins to move further into the basement, D-1974 takes a step up the stairs. Jamie, we go this way, but we need to stay close. This way. This way? Into the dark, creepy basement? Are you serious? D-1974 turns and continues up the stairs. Jamie, wait! D-1974 reaches the top of the stairs. Don't leave. D-1974 emerges from the basement. Full power has returned to the sight lights, to the extent D-1974 and his surroundings look overexposed. He holds up his arm, shielding his eyes from the light. He proceeds to stumble through the corridor, trying to handle each door as he goes. The last breaks off in his hand. He drops it and continues on, eventually returning to outside the interview room. Baines was right. I… I swore it was the other side of the site. A pool of congealing blood covers the corridor floor. Within it lies Officer Lauren's handgun. The corpse, however, is nowhere to be seen. D-1974 picks up the gun and proceeds onwards. He turns into the next corridor and immediately shouts out, Oh, thank God! Hello? Hello? Ahead, a figure rests against the corridor wall. D-1974 runs towards it. I need help. There's been a breach. We need to get out of… As he approaches, D-1974 trails off. The figure in front of him is dressed in sight security gear. It holds a lit cigarette in his left hand. It raises the cigarette and inserts the end into its exposed trachea. The trachea slurps and contracts as the cigarette smoke is inhaled. Out, out, out of here. R.E.C. Rosso raises his spare hand and swats in the direction of D-1974. As he does so, the mess of fibers and viscera at the top of his neck, exposed by the absence of a head, flap about. D-1974 steps backwards, bumping into an unknown object. He spins around and begins to stutter, but is interrupted. We're on break. Fuck off. R.E.C. Vidal and R.E.C. Miller walk around D-1974, 
towards R.E.C. Rosso. The latter reaches into his pocket and pulls out a carton of cigarettes, offering them to his newly arrived teammates. This better not be another rewrite. D-1974 sprints away. The camera follows, positioned closely behind him. He navigates through a complex maze of corridors, which seem to grow increasingly narrow. He enters corridor after corridor, until he turns into one and freezes. Ahead of him stands 6733-1. He pulls out the gun, aims and fires. Nothing happens. He pulls the gun near his face to take a closer look, before switching from holding the handle to the barrel. He squeezes. The gun shatters. Fragile plastic fragments scatter across the floor. I found you. D-1974 startles, as Dr. Baines approaches him from behind. It's okay, you're improvising. We can work with that. But we need to get to the basement, Jamie. You understand that, right? Dr. Baines reaches out towards D-1974. Get away from me! With its full force, D-1974 shoves Dr. Baines away, sending him flying backwards. He collides with the corridor wall. The entirety of the wall shakes before falling completely backwards. As it hits the floor, wooden splinters erupt into the air. Dr. Baines falls with it. Next, a lighting rig falls from the ceiling. It lands on Dr. Baines, pinning him in place. The fallen wall exposes only pitch black darkness behind it. Ah, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Oh Christ. Oh shit. An unidentified woman runs into the frame. I'm. I'm sorry. Are you hurt? I'm alright, I'm alright. Fucking amateurs, man. Christ. More unidentified persons enter the shot. In the background, the slasher begins to walk down the corridor, towards the commotion. Look at yourself first. You couldn't get him to the goddamn basement. Who? Who are you people? Can we get a medic on set, please? The slasher approaches D-1974. They halt suddenly and stare directly at the camera. Shit. We're going to need a production and lighting back to reset this. Are they still on the lot? The camera begins to zoom in, focusing on 6733-1's face. As it zooms in, D-1974, Dr. Baines, and the unknown individuals are excluded from the frame. D-1974 off-screen. Where am I? Fifth unknown. Off screen. Cut, cut. 6733-1's face takes up the entirety of the shot. D-1974 off screen. Where the hell am I? D-1974 screams. The tape cuts to black. Afterward, the above transcript of SCP-6733's contents was created after the tape was watched by D-1888 during a testing session overseen by Dr. Carpenter. There has never been an individual by the name of Malcolm Baines in Foundation employment. D-1888 has been placed in protective custody and is to be afforded maximum security.